It's very hard without a working functional pro a product to sell an idea. Now, if you have a working functional product, it's way easier to sell it. But again, very difficult to convince a corporation, anybody from a corporation, to buy that idea unless it's selling in the marketplace, unless they know that it will sell. Episode 131. This is The Business of Architecture. Welcome back, Architect Nation. This is the show where you'll discover tips, strategies, and secrets for running a profitable and impactful architecture practice. If you believe that it's possible to make money and do good, then this is the show for you. If you aren't already on the Business of Architecture email list, make sure you claim your free account on businessofarchitecture.com by clicking the green Join Today button. I'm your host, Enix Sears. Today's show is sponsored by BQE Software, the makers of ArchiOffice. ArchiOffice is the office and project management software built with the needs of architects in mind. And for a limited time, startup firms can get two free seats of ArchiOffice for a year. Go check it out at ArchiOffice.com. Now, there's one other thing I want to let you know about. If you listen to podcasts, make sure you go subscribe to ArchiSpeak. You can find it on iTunes or visit ArcaSpeakPodcast.com. ArcaSpeak is a casual conversation about all things architecture. Super entertaining podcast with a healthy dose of humor by my three friends, Cormac Phelan, Neil Pan, and Evan Troxel. When you head on over there, let them know you heard about it on Business of Architecture. If you're anything like me, you probably have several ideas inside of you that you feel as if you just brought them to market, they would change the world. Maybe you feel like there's a book that you want to write. Maybe you have an invention or some sort of product idea. These kind of things come naturally to us as architects because they tie in very well with what we learned in school, which is design and creation. Well, today's show is all about taking your skills and training as an architect and applying it to other areas like writing, creating books, and developing products. Today's guest is a practicing architect who currently works with the firm of Job Moore designing high-end custom homes based out of Greenwich, Connecticut. In addition to practicing architecture, he's the creator of How To Architect, an educational platform, and a YouTube channel with over 12 million video views across the web. He's the author of a book published by the MIT Press, How To Architect, and he's the creator of multiple products, including the Architect's Bird Feeder, which you can find online. Today's guest is architect Doug Pat. What is up, Mr. Doug Pat? How are you doing today, Enoch? Nice to see you. Good to see you too. Welcome to Business of Architecture. So we have a lot to cover today. There's just so many things that you're involved in, it's hard to know where to start. But let's start with your journey to becoming an architect. Tell us a little bit about that. Get our readers oriented with your background. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it's interesting. I actually didn't want to be an architect, at least initially. Uh, I've, to I've told this story a couple times on my YouTube channel and, and to friends uh, when I was in 11th grade, my dad came to me and he said, um, so what'd you sign up for college prep, prep or Votech? And, uh, you know, locally here, that was, you decide to go into vocational technical school and you pick that track or you're, you know, preparing to go to college. I said, Votech. And he said, well, you know, Dougie, you got really good grades. I'm not so sure I understand why you're going to do that. Don't you want to go to college? And I said, you know, I, I really don't, I'm, I'm not thinking about college at all. I'm not that interested, and I, I think I'd rather just fix cars. And uh, he was like, wow, Doug, you know, I really think you should rethink that decision. At some point, you're going to have a family, and you're going to want to uh, be able to take care of everybody, and I'm just not sure that's going to be an, an easy living for you long term. And uh, I said, okay, you know, I'll give it some thought. And uh, I think I had a couple days to decide, and I ultimately decided to do college prep instead of OTEC. And uh, that, you know, went pretty well and eventually came to me again. And he said, okay, well, it's time to apply to go to college. Where are you going to apply? And I said, you know, I'm, I'm just not sure I even want to go to college. And he said, you know, I, I really think you should probably rethink that, I, <laughs> that idea too. I, you know, you're, you seem to be a smart guy and you get good grades. And I think you'd be, I think you'd really uh, enjoy going to college. And so I, I thought about it another couple of days, eventually came back to me. I came home from school one day and he said, so what'd you decide? I said, well, okay, you know, I, I think I'm going to go to college. And he said, well, what do you want to study? I said, well, I want to be an actor. <laughs> and uh, he was like, okay, well, let's talk about that. And uh, he said, look, 
I'm not so sure acting is going to work out for you long term. It's a tough way to make a living and a tough way to take care of a family if you have one someday. And so I really think you should think about what I do. I'm a businessman and my father was a realtor and he said, you know, you could uh, go into real estate. Uh, but I really think you're well suited to be an architect. And so my dad's best friend or one of his best friends is an architect. And uh, he was a local guy here. He went to Penn State as well. His name's Bob Breslin. And, and uh, Bob has a very, to this day, Bob and Robin, his son, a very successful business. And they do, uh, they do schools, uh, essentially. And they've been doing it since the 1970s and very successful. So he said, you know, uh, Bob does very well and you, you guys should talk. And I think, you know, you should study architecture. At least give it a shot. Try to get in. And so, he, and, and you know, during that conversation, he also said, you know, you really like to play with Legos and you're, you're very creative and you're always drawing. And he, he would bring home these, they were called listing sheets at the time. They're eight and a half by 11. They came in different colors and they had a picture of a house on the front and the listing. So it's the same kind of thing you'd see on the MLS uh, if you're a realtor. And uh, only they were sheets of paper. And I'm not kidding you. We had thousands of these listings laying around and, you know, they were old. And so we turned them over and I draw houses on them. So anyway, you know, oddly enough, I ended up getting into architecture school at Penn State and I really loved it. Although I've got to say I enjoyed the theory stuff way more than what seemed to be the practical elements of being an architect. And uh, uh, but I, you know, I ended up really excelling and enjoying it and, uh, you know, made it all the way through uh, five years of school at Penn State. And uh, it really worked out. And then uh, I went away to Europe and, and stayed there for about a year and a half. And I essentially worked for food and met friends and got jobs that way and, and then eventually got into the University of Pennsylvania, came back here. But I, I, once I started at Penn, I really thought I'm going to get a PhD and I'm just going to teach. I really like the theory and I don't – I really don't think I ever want to practice architecture. And about midway through the school, I met uh, a guy named Wesley Way who did a lot of – is kind of a well-known local guy doing very, con very contemporary residential stuff. And he came to one of my critiques and Wesley had taught at Penn State. So I was familiar with him, although I had never had him as a teacher. And we finished the review and I had asked Wesley, I said, you know, for um, – uh, during the winter break, can I come and work at your office for a month in between? And he said, well, let me come to one of your reviews and we'll see how you do. And he came to a review. He was there 10 minutes. He walked out. And after the review, he walked up to me, said, you got the job. It was great. So I went to work with him briefly. And then I graduated from school and went to work with him. And it was probably one of the toughest jobs I have ever had. I mean, we didn't get paid much money, but I learned a ton. And he was a great teacher, very challenging guy, but very bright and very talented. And uh, it was a great experience. I did a little bit of work at Breslin's office after that, but ultimately ended up in residential work. I, I just, uh, it ended up being a great fit for me. Uh, I ended up working for a small office at the time of a small portion of the office. It was called Zigger Sneed in Baltimore in their residential department. It was just like one of two people there. And so I got my feet wet there. It was kind of trial by fire. I remember it was, uh, they just kind of threw me into, I probably, I did. They told me later I oversold uh, my credentials, but I did get the job. And then it got really challenging because I had had no real experience running jobs and I was running jobs immediately. So, so perhaps, perhaps was, passion uh, and selling yourself is a common theme here. <laughs> <laughs> right, absolutely. Let, let's go. Let's go back to the the guy you worked for right out of school, who was the the guy who came for the crit, and he did the contemporary design. You said yeah. that you learned some really really key things there. Can we go back to that just for a minute? Yeah, can you sorry, I just dig like up, no, no problem. Dig, dig up ahead. some of the lessons. What were some of the really important things that you feel you learned working for him in that job that you said was just so tough? Well, back then we drew all the time. I mean, that's what we did. And back and then was when. Oh my gosh. So 1993 uh, was 90s. when I was in, yeah, early 90s. Okay. 
and yep. uh, 1991 and 293, something around there. Everything was drawn, so everything was done by hand, and I love to draw. So he hired me because I could draw perspectives very quickly. I could generate perspectives very quickly by hand, and so he loved that. And we did. I did lots of drawings that ended up uh, getting published in magazines, and so that was you know I, I was an asset in in that regard. Uh, and he was also a very detail oriented guy. So we literally would draw, let's say we would draw the interior. He did some renovations of some downtown Rittenhouse Square apartment buildings uh, that were very high end. And we would draw the interiors of these spaces, the plan details at half inch scale. And we would literally draw every tile and every line. And you would draw a shower, for example, so that there were no cut tiles down to the eighth of an inch. I'm not kidding you. Interior elevations uh, you know, uh, interior sections cut through the, the showers and all the interior elevations, and you could have no cut tiles in these spaces. And so we drew to an incredible degree of detail. So I learned how, I mean, I was all, already detail oriented, but I learned how to draw well with Wesley. I also learned how to hand letter. And he had a very kind of peculiar way of um, wanting letters to be drawn. They were quite beautiful, but they were actually a little difficult to read. But I I, I learned how to draw and hand letter again very well and so stylistically that developed for me over time and I was able then later to do the same kind of skills in other offices. And I would also say that, you know, Wesley was as temperamental as am I and it was it was difficult and challenging to work for a guy who was so demanding. I mean, it was just, it was a really tough time for me um, mentally. And so it was a great experience, but I learned a lot about me and what I could handle and the kind of pressure that, you know, at some point I couldn't handle anymore. And so it was an interesting experience in many, many ways. But I would say in terms of architecture, it was, uh, I learned how to draw really well. With how, him. how did how did you get through that the the toughness that you said the mental the mental part of it where he was perhaps coming down on you hard perhaps I think you said very temperamental. Yeah, I talked to my parents a lot. I'd call my father and I'd say, "Hey, Dad, you know how do I manage this?" And you know, you're just saying that makes reminds me that I was so lucky to have I have young parents and so and my dad. I, I think, although however challenging it is to be a teenager, once you get out into the world and you call home and you need some help with challenging things, my dad, my mom and dad, and my dad in particular with business was always there. So he, he too had those kinds of challenging relationships in his life. And so he was able to not only relate, but help me kind of think through and work through those problems. So I had my father. Uh, to call and to help me learn how to deal with stress and difficult people. Uh, I don't think I would have made it otherwise. Um, and then, of course, I met my wife uh, around that period in time as well. We didn't get married for another few years after I had left Wesley's office, but I think she was a great sounding board for me. And, you know, when you meet somebody who will listen to you, who's interested in you, uh, that was really, really helpful. And I, I should add, you know, one of the one of the things that I found being I've been married for 20 years. And, you know, one of the great things about marrying somebody who is completely unlike me is that she's actually interested in me. So she and I, I'm interested in who she is because she does something so different than what I do that it's interesting to me. And I think having found somebody that is unlike me has actually been very, very helpful because she, she listens, you know? So I don't know if everybody's like that, but it certainly has been helpful for me. So. Interesting. And so she's not, what does she do? She's not aligned with uh, architecture. I take it. Yeah, she is not. She actually used to work in the oil uh, industry for Texaco and Texaco was purchased by Chevron. And then ultimately she uh, moved into the real estate world and she worked with my father for many years. She started a mortgage business with them and now she works for the president of Prudential Fox Roach uh, locally here in Philadelphia. Um, she's out of Devon, so she does some commuting. But uh, yeah, what she does is very different than what I do. So. Well, Doug, so you have you have a lot of things that you've been involved in. I, you know, you have products you've developed. You have the the How to Architect YouTube channel, which has inspired and and taught thousands of people. You have millions of views on that channel. 
tell us how how you started. Wh- when did you start going from architecture, uh, just the practice of architecture, and starting to get into these other projects and um, adventures? Well, I'd always been interested in doing something else as well as practicing as an architect. So my dad was right. I was always going to need something that I could do to pay the bills. And then I could do other things as an aside. So, you know, one of the first things I I was always working when I went home from work, I was always doing something and trying different things and trying to find outlets for my creativity. And so the first thing I ever did was I rented a Mac computer. Uh, We lived in Lansdale, Pennsylvania, and it was about an hour from work. And I tried to get a national endowments for the art grant, uh, arts grant to uh, write a book and do a project about uh, architecture. Uh, art and architecture. And so it related to the artwork that I was doing at the time and architecture. And I ultimately never got the grant and used the computer to, to uh, you know, digitally put together this presentation and it didn't work out. But that's one of the first projects I remember doing and working really hard at something outside of architecture. Much later, I wrote a children's book that was never published. And um, a funny story. I mean, I've got a lot of stories, but uh, when I, when we lived in Maryland in 1996, uh, we were having an awful time. The economy was horrible, and I had moved from Philadelphia to be with my wife uh, in Maryland. She was getting two master's degrees at the University of Maryland at the time, and uh, I was so I was destitute for money. I had uh, cashed in ninety dollars in pennies. And uh, I was living on uh, like $2.50 pizzas, frozen pizzas from down the street and, uh, and like a six pack of beer that I'd make last six days. And uh, I, I was just trying to pay the bills and I was going on job interviews and door to door trying to get an architecture job. And I ultimately uh, wrote, drove around in my car and drew, drew people's homes without them knowing it. And then I'd try to sell the pictures of their house to them door to door. And I never sold one. Never sold I, one. I got bit by a dog. I got chased off of porches. And I never – I must have put together five or six of these things. And, you know, it take it would take hours, days to put these together. And then I try to sell them and nobody, little did I know, I mean, these neighborhoods, everybody was said the economy was awful. Nobody was, you know, spending any money. Bunch of lowbrows. Yeah, it was it no was appreciation awful. for art. It was awful. But it was one of my first entrepreneurial experiences just trying to make money and pay bills. Eventually I got a job uh working for Dwani Platter Zyberg uh, out of the Kentlands uh for a couple of weeks and then I got a job with Zigger Sneed. But anyway, um then after I worked with Job's office, I'd been with Job's office for a year or two. I invented this playhouse. My wife said, hey, look, all architects design a playhouse, design a playhouse for the kids, for Eva, who was very young at the time. And so I did. My brother, Chad, my brother, who you know has worked for Nike and Converse, also a very, very talented creative guy, said, instead of designing one playhouse, design a playhouse that could be four playhouses and one playhouse, you know. And so I did, and I designed this thing that could be – it required no tools or fasteners. It locked and slid together, very interesting composition, and you could take the thing apart, and it would be four playhouses or put it together. It would be one giant playhouse, and I actually ultimately made this thing and tried to – sell it and got it in front of through some friends got it through in front of Hasbro and Little Tykes and again had no luck whatsoever but that really wet my whistle for getting closer and trying to and, and the whole product development thing and realizing that I could as an architect I had all the skills to actually make real products and so that really set me in this product development direction as well. And I'm really passionate about this. I mean, I think architects, you, you, you can start at the top being an architect. And once you're an architect, you've learned everything you need to know to be a product developer. You may not be a great product developer, but you know from start to finish, you've managed the process of getting something thing, something made, right? And, and that's what product development is. So if you're creative and you could figure out how to do all the other stuff, the websites and the marketing and the branding and get help, and then ultimately you can do these things. So I did the Playhouse. Uh, I did this really awesome man bag that was made out of steel, and it was really cool. I never had that made, and that turned into a total failure. And 
Uh, there, there are a bunch of products that I eventually created, but uh, I did. Well, tell me about tell me about your view on failure, Doug. It sounds like you you oh you hit a lot of things that could be ta- called failures. Yeah, uh, most of my life is is failures. It's not successes. I mean, I say I use the word failure. They're really not failures, but they're they are composed of time and money, and they ultimately went nowhere. And I, I you know. I will tell you that 95% of the things that I work on go nowhere. And so it's really hard. You've got to, you know, you've got to kind of pick yourself back up every single time something goes nowhere and figure out how to make it go somewhere. So, you know, my wife always says the one the one really unusual thing she sees in me is that I never quit. And I think it's a personality trait and I also think, you know, it's a, it's a nature nurture thing. You know, it's part of who you are and it's also part of you, who you were nurtured to be. Uh, and I always encourage other people to keep going, but that is not to say that I haven't been incredibly depressed and had some incredibly challenging times in my life because I thought something was really going to happen and it didn't. We, uh, I've eventually started an idea company with a, a gentleman named Brian Whitland, who's still a good friend, and we're not together anymore simply because the economy again tanked and our business went in a kind of a sour direction uh, because of the economy. But we sold one of our companies for a ton of money, and we could have uh, you know come close to retiring, and then the economy tanked, and we lost everything. I mean, all the revenue was tied up in royalty, long-term royalties in the product, mm-hmm. and it just didn't happen like we had thought. We made a great deal, but the economy crashed, and everybody's businesses kind of went south, and it didn't happen. So again, you know, I've I've been very very close. But it doesn't always, you know, it doesn't always happen. But again, that didn't, you know, stop me either. I've st- I've had some small successes here and there with products, and I love the product development business, uh, and I continue to do it. And someday, uh, I'll really nail it, you know. But well, in uh, the product development, what are you working on recently? What's your latest thing you've been doing, or what are you doing now? Well, I'm still working. I, I have a product that still sells called the Architects Bird Feeder, and that has been relatively successful. It's a great product. It works really well. People like it. They don't complain about it. They buy it. They love it. So that's still on the market. The challenge with being so busy with so many things is I don't have time to market these things and spend what spend the kind of time developing more what are called SKUs. So most businesses like Walmart, for example, I talked to a guy who sold at Walmart. He said, Doug, we love the product, but we need more SKUs. So you need more variations on the product, which means you need more money, which means you need money and time to develop products, to grow the businesses. And so, you know, there's always that with growing businesses and where are they ultimately going to go? And do you have the stamina to do that? And I think I've been through this so many times that at this point in time in my life with a little bit older kids and now I'm looking at college and I'm looking at having to really support them financially, going off into business, going off into these business ventures is really much less likely than it was 10 or 15 years ago for me. So I'm working on that and I'm I'm working on another book, How to Architect the Book has been very successful. It's still a top seller with MIT Press and I get pictures all the time from wonderful people who take pictures of it, you know, in the in the Louvre uh, bookstore or at uh, Falling Water or wherever it may be and say, hey, Doug, I came across your book here. This is so cool. And so that's been really, really rewarding. And so I'm working on another one and it'll probably be years until I'm finished with that. And, so, so our, our listeners, they might be listening, they might be thinking, you know what, that would be really cool. I have a product idea within me. I have a book within me. What does it take to get something like that actually done? What really goes on behind the scenes that, that people don't see? It's a great question. One of the most important things to do is make sure somebody hasn't done what you want to do already. I would say that more so with products. Uh, with books, you've, you've got to be careful. There are just so many titles out there. You've got to spend some time making sure somebody hasn't written about the exact same thing. The interesting thing about writing uh, if you are a decent writer, is that you can always create something that's you, that's imparting part of you. And so even if somebody's written about what you want to write about, what you write about should should and will ultimately be from your perspective. So I, I don't like looking at other people's 
books many times because I don't want to know what they've written about because I want to write about something and I don't I don't want that to influence my writing. I know that sounds a little quirky and upside down, but uh, product development's a little different. You know, you really have to spend a lot of time making sure nobody's already solved the problem you're trying to solve. So that involves patentability searches, and there are great companies now that do patentability searches, and you can pay $600 to $1,000 and get a company to do a search. They'll say, well, it's, you know, it's, we're not professional attorneys, and, but they're very good. You can do your own patentability search, but uh, I would recommend that anybody do a patentability search. Once you've figured out that nobody solved the problem that you're trying to solve and created a utility or a design patent around the subject matter, uh, then you go for it and you write a provisional, what's called a provisional patent application. There's a great book called uh, Patent Pro Se, uh, and that's, that has, is really, really helpful in terms of uh, figuring out how to write a provisional patent application. And once you write a provisional application and send it off to the U.S. government, they never look at it, but it's a placeholder for one year. So if you ever had legal trouble and you did get a patent on that product following or within that one-year period, uh, you could go back to that and say, hey, look, I have my placeholder here. I, I, I patented that thing. So it's a legal document. But once that is over, once that's up, that time period's up, you're done. You know, you can either write a new provisional patent application and set that date that it's filed with USPTO, uh, or you can get a patent. And that is expensive. And that's a, that, again, is a real challenge for people. You've got to come up with, let's say, in between twenty and $80,000, depending on what you're trying to patent. Very expensive proposition. And then if you're protecting that, if you get a few patents, and somebody's infringing on your patent, it's a million dollars from what I understand to go to court to protect your patented uh, object or thing. So it's a really challenging business, you know. But outside of that, most people, everybody's got a great idea, but it, a great idea is honestly, they're a dime a dozen. And, and people tell me all the time, hey, I want to tell you my idea, but I want 25% if I tell it to you and you take it to market. And I think, I tell them, I say, look, you know, 10, 5% of this project is your idea. 95% is taking it to market. So no, you know, and plus people don't steal ideas until they're making money, honestly. Until they know that your product is awesome, it's working, people are buying it, they're not gonna steal it unless they're geniuses and they're loaded and they could do anything they want. You know, you when you decide to take a product to market, it's really time consuming and expensive. And uh, but it's a very interesting business, and being being involved in it as an architect has been kind of fun because you be just like high end residential work where you've got to kind of be an expert, a jack of all trades, an expert at lots of things because the materials are so vast and the details are so vast. The same thing with product development. You've got to be really good at, at something. I mean, I became not an expert, but kind of an expert overnight at thermoplastics and elastomers because one of our products that you know we sold was an elastomer product. And so you learn all these really interesting things that you never thought in your entire life you'd learn about. And I love that. I think that's like the greatest thing in life is to keep learning. So. Does anyone just say, you know, forget the patent, let's just let's just screw it, let's do it, Richard Branson style, you know, let's just get the product out there and not not do the whole patent thing. Is that Absolutely. a viable possibility? It is if you have lots of money. So if you've got money and you've got a really good business plan and you take that product to market really fast, just blow it out. Like we're watching, I mean, I've been watching, I love NFL football and Draft Kings and Fan Duel. I mean, I've seen advertisements for these two businesses endlessly for the last two weeks. I mean, I can't remember people's names, but I just remembered these two businesses, right? And I'm not even a gambler, but they are spending millions and millions and millions on this business to get it out there, to blow it out, to make tons of money. That's the way you got to do it if you take a product. Like, like me, if you're not a corporation, 
you're just a little guy with one or two people that might be helping you or just by yourself, get some angel venture money, uh, get 500,000 bucks, a million bucks, get a good investor, give them 20%, give them 30%, whatever they want. If you really believe that, if they believe in you and you really believe you can make it happen, that's the way to do it. And then you don't have to worry about it. Make sure you're not infringing on somebody else's patents. Take it to market and make your money and then whatever happens, happens. People are going to rip you off anyway. That's just the way business is and corporations are going to, they're going to take you down. I mean, that's just the way it works. So... <laughs> <laughs> Talk to me about selling an idea because it sounds like and even with your very first products you were pitching this, you talked about with the uh, – I think it was the the Playhouse. You said you got that in front of Hasbro uh, through some friends. Yeah. So, so tell me about that process of you know how you approach pitching someone on when you have an idea. Well, it's, it's interesting. The, the first thing I would say is when we first started I, our, our, our idea business back in 2005, we thought that's what we were going to do. We thought we're going to sell ideas. And so we had lots of really interesting ideas. In fact, we, we I believe, were one of the first people to come up with the idea of uh, moving money through your cell phone. So one of our ideas, we talked to a big U.S. bank at one time, and I said, look, I have this idea. Let's – I should be able to take my cell phone and send $25 to a friend and I can be the bank. Anybody could be the bank and we should just be able to type it in your cell phone. And they're like, no, you can't do that. You're not a bank. There's, too much regulation. Never, there's no, there's no market for that. Yeah. Never right. Happened. We're, I'm like, no, I'm telling you, this is a great idea. And they're like, no, that will never happen. Or it, it's ways <laughs> off and you know, it's not a good idea. So, it's really that all of that is to say it's very hard without a working functional pro a product to sell an idea. Now, if you have a working functional product, it's way easier to sell it. But again, very difficult to convince a corporation, anybody from a corporation to buy that idea unless it's selling in the marketplace, unless they know that it will sell. So you really need a track record in my experience. You need two things. You need somebody really high up in a corporation who is going to go to bat for you, who will listen to you, who likes you and believes in you and believes that you're a winner and your product is a winner and you need money. So or, or you need backing. You need people to get to that point, right? I mean, you need to be able to get to that point. You need a functioning product and you need some, so it's three things really. You need some, a at least a little bit of money. You need a functioning product and you, meet, you need somebody inside a corporation who's going to listen to you and maybe even buy your idea or license it. But really tough. I mean, very, very unique. We've, we had some unique situations, but again, it was through connections. Uh, my yeah, business how, how would you go about getting those introductions? Doug? Well, this the company that we ultimately sold, my business partner was in – he went to Stanford University and he was in a review at Stanford and he's sitting there with his product and somebody uh, – just some guy sitting next to him looked at it and said, hey, man, that is amazing. What is that? He said, oh, it's my invention. You know, Let me explain it to you. And the guy's like, dude, that – is awesome. I know somebody who would love to see that. And within a couple of weeks, we got a phone call. Hey, we want to buy your company. So it kind of works like that. You, you really need to spend some time meeting people and making connections. And I mean, it's sad, but true. That's the only way you can do it. So these TV shows are awesome because Shark Tank, you, you know, it can make or break you. I, I, I didn't, get a request to do that, but I submit, I made a, a submittal to Shark Tank and I eventually got a phone call and they said, hey, we love your product. We think you'd be great on Shark Tank. What do you think? Here's the submission process. And I started doing the application. I started thinking, you know, this could really make a fool out of me and I'm, I'm not there in my life anymore. You know, 10 years ago, I would not have cared about getting on television and somebody just destroying me. You know, I fall apart on camera, whatever happens, whatever could happen. I just thought to myself, you know what? I just, that's not what I want to do with my life anymore. So I'm not going to do it. But those shows prove that you have a good idea and you get in front of these people. And if you don't get made a fool of and somebody actually likes it, your idea, they could 
help fund you. And it's not the money. It's the connection that's important. Once you meet that right person and they go to bat for you, then retail opens up and you've got, all, you've got somebody that will help you sell that product in the marketplace and help you make some money. So mm. that's the way to do it. That's interesting. You know, and I know, I know at least I, when I tell people I'm into marketing, a lot of people start telling me their ideas and how wonderful they are and how they're going to go out and earn a million bucks mm. because they have this great product idea. Go get them. Yeah, I just say, awesome. It sounds great. <laughs> <laughs> you know, there is, for me, there's kind of one defining moment uh, when I decided that I really wanted to try product development. And that was, I was at a Penn State football game. They just enlarged the stadium to 100,000 people, capacity. And I'm sitting there and I look out on the crowd and the game's about to start. And I thought, oh my gosh, I could create a product and sell it all in for five bucks. I'm sorry, create the product all in for $5 and sell it for 10 to everybody in this stadium and make half a million dollars in one day. Mm. If I could do that, and I think I can do that, that would be really fulfilling. So I've always kind of, I've always, I always, that's in my head all the time. Mm. I love that idea. And so maybe that's why I'm not a full-time architect and I do all these other things because, you know, maybe I wasn't, cut out just to be – maybe I was cut out to be a product developer and not an architect. I don't know. <laughs> well, there, there's, there's something else that motivates you because I can tell it's not, it's not just the money. The example you gave there was a monetary. Maybe it is. Is, is money what motivates you, Doug? I, it always has, although I've never made a lot of money. You know, I, that has just never been part of what has happened in my life. So what would, what would money give you? If, if, you if, if you had that million-dollar exit or $10 million exit, you know, what, what would money get you? I, it would get me probably some peace of mind. I'd, I'd know that I could put the girls through school. You know, that would really make me feel like, okay, whew, I got that off my chest and I can help them out as much as I want to. Well, what you know, is that what, nowadays? That's like a couple hundred grand nowadays, right? Yeah, we were told – we started seeing a financial person uh, because we started realizing how crazy life is just a couple of years ago. And I think his estimate at the time was for one of them, 225 to 250 and the other 275, you know, something wow. nuts, yeah. nuts. So half a million bucks to send the kids to school. So, you know, whether or not we're going to be able to help them and how much and how that actually works out. So anyway, you know, for me, that's kind of all in the back of my mind. And then retiring, you know, I look at people who have government jobs and they have pensions, and I think to myself, oh my gosh, you know, I could do that, but is that what I really want to do with my life now? And will, I, you know, if I could, or should I have gone into the, my dad was in the military. He, loved, he enjoyed the military. He was only in for five years. It was during Vietnam. And he always said, you know, Dougie, I think you should go into the military. I think you'd be great in the military and, and it really straightens men out and it gives you a, a, a great perspective on life. And, I look back at friends who made that decision and are now retired and they're at 55. And I think, oh my gosh, I mean, what am I going to do? Architecture is such a challenging business. And that, you know, it's, it's not like somebody sets up your retirement for you and you're always, you know, it's like you're always, what does my friend call it? Uh, feeding the beast. Mm. You're constantly feeding. He does kitchens. He's a mill worker. Mm. And he's like, Doug, this is crazy. I mean, I've got to feed the beast constantly. I can never stop feeding the beast. So, mm. <laughs> anyway, you know, that's challenging. So, it is. <laughs> <laughs> I'm well, really opening up. <laughs> that's good. <laughs> And that's a wrap for another show about the business of architecture. To get more resources about how you, as an architect, can run a rewarding business that is both fun, flexible, and profitable, visit businessofarchitecture.com and click the Join button to claim your free account to Business of Architecture Insider. As a member, you'll have access to free tools and resources to help you get more clients, start a new firm, and much more. You'll also get access to my book, Social Media for Architects, where you'll learn how to use internet tools for fun and for profit. Until next week, this has been The Business of Architecture.
The views expressed on the show by my guests do not represent those of the host, and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract, bond, or commitment, except to help you conquer the world. Bump music credit to Ben Folds 5, Do It Anyway.